and healthy. And we're going to talk about today is uh, a clinic I put together on tips for researching and building prototype structures. As always, this is a typical NMRA clinic in that it's a 60-minute clinic normally. I've curtailed it down to 30. Uh, I'm going to try not to talk too fast. Uh, I don't know how Ernie wants to handle questions or whatever. If somebody wants to ask a question, I have no problem getting interrupted. I don't think there's that many people on here. It'll be a big deal. So there's really, the when you start considering building a model of a prototype building, there's really two approaches. And I bet nobody expected the first thing they'd see is a picture of the colonial governor's house in 18th century Virginia in a model railroad clinic. But really what I'm looking at here is two different approaches to prototype modeling. And one is uh, Colonial Williamsburg is a good expression of this. It's an exact as possible replication, uh, replication of what was based on extensive archeological evidence and research. But the other approach you can take to this is called what I call a buffet approach. And that's exemplified by places like Greenfield Village in Michigan. And it's really a combination of buildings from different areas, pretty much from the same era, that create, when combined together, create a believable quote unquote prototype. Uh, if you had to ask me which approach I use for my own modeling, it's certainly the buffet approach. Uh, my friend Paul Dolkus likes to express it as he's trying to write a historical novel, not a history textbook. But anyway, uh, no matter what I'm doing as far as researching a building, the first thing I usually start with is a photo. There's a number of great sources for photos. Uh, you can find them in obviously railroad books, Morning Sun books, all the different dozens of railroad books or hundreds of railroad books that have been published over the years. The Central Vermont alone, which is my personal pet prototype, has had at least three dozen books published specifically on the CV. Uh, postcards, like you see in the lower right-hand corner there, those are a great source of information on buildings and structures, especially from pre-1900. Uh, you'll also, but I would not necessarily take the, the coloration on postcards, vintage postcards, to be too literal. Uh, very often, there's more an expression of the artist's imagination than what was actually there. If I looked hard enough, I could find a postcard of this exact same structure you see right here, this station in Richmond, Vermont. Uh, I could find one that shows it painted yellow. I could find another one painted red in, this, in the exact same postcard. Uh, one place I found a lot of interesting buildings, and we'll talk about it a little bit later because I've found a couple of them we're going to talk about here, uh, is in what I call town histories, and that's those books on the left. Especially back during the time period of the bicentennial, an awful lot of small towns, especially in New England, published town histories. And they had everything from the, you know, the, the local high school basketball team in the 1930s and 40s, uh, running up through buildings and there would be chapters on how we live and how we work and what we do for fun and, and they all sort of have that same theme to them. Uh, three of them you see here, Richford, Vermont. Uh, I don't know of anybody else other than people in Richford that would consider Richford, Vermont a frontier town, but I guess they did at the time. Uh, and then Randolph, that particular book has a lot of great photographs of really interesting buildings. And then you can see the one in the background there is Ennisburg Falls, which is, uh, which is another town history I've been using. I'd be remiss if I didn't say you can just use Google and look around for buildings of uh, pictures of buildings and structures that you want to model. If you just Google search the name of the town you're interested in or the location you're interested in, do an image search, uh, you very, very often will find a lot of neat pictures on there. And then, of course, there's Google Maps and Street View. And then there's also sites like Shorpy. And it's kind of fun to go back to Shorpy every so often and look at it and just type in some town names from the place you're modeling, maybe the railroad name of your favorite prototype or prototypes railroads. Uh, you never know what you're gonna see. Uh, for example, a few months ago, maybe a year ago or so, I typed in Ennisburg Falls, Vermont, and this picture came up. Now I've typed in Ennisburg Falls, Vermont a number of times, and this picture never came up until, like I said, about a year ago. Uh, this is actually Ennisburg Falls in September of 1941. Uh, an interesting picture, a typical small town, uh, the M3 class consolidation crossing, the, crossing Main Street there. Uh, but if you really start studying this photo, you can come up with some interesting signature items that you might want to add to a prototype scene that you're modeling. And they may not be immediately obvious without really studying these pictures. For example, you see there's an old ice cream parlor 
which is actually an old creamery, no longer a rail serve creamery, but it was built as one. Uh, that's now an ice cream shop. There is the Shell gas station on the left, and that gas station, I can see enough of the corner of it to know that it's actually built to a very common Shell station standard design. The old Magnuson uh, resin kit, if you've ever seen the Magnuson resin gas station kit, is very very similar to that design. Um, and there's even, I mean, what gas station is incomplete without a popcorn stand uh, along Main Street there, and that is what that is, is a popcorn stand. Uh, I'd expect to see something like that, like a, a gee dunk stand, like we used to call it in the Navy. I'd expect to see that in a, you know, maybe in a larger town or a small city. Uh, this is actually a town that had about 2,000 inhabitants at the time this picture was taken. Uh, and then to the right there, you see another building kind of where the boxcars are spotted. And it looks to me like it might be a feed mill. I, don't, I can't quite read the sign behind the trees. I can't quite read the sign at the extreme edge. But uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting scene and I wanted to take a look at it a little closer. So the first thing I did is went to Google Street View and stood at the corner of Main Street in Ennisburg Falls, Vermont, as it looks today. And what you see down the middle there, the footpath, is the former Central Vermont right-of-way. That's now a bike and uh, hiking trail along this particular branch. And the left-hand side there, you see the the current version of that ice cream parlor, that building, and you can see how it was indeed a rail serve creamery, a small one, but you can see the various white extensions and uh, pieces of the building on the back there that indicate that was there. But on the right-hand side, that grain elevator is not there. There's, uh, there's maybe some one-story building sheds that are still left on the back that could have been part of the grain elevator. It might not have been, I really don't know. Uh, but this particular thing, if you wanted to figure out what that grain elevator looked like or that feed mill looked like, you really wouldn't know from this. Another thing you can look at, and when you start talking about researching railroads, one of the first things people tell you to do is look at the Sanborn maps. Sanborn maps are fire insurance valuation maps. There is actually a complete set of them in color at the Library of Congress. Uh, a number of years ago, you would have had to go down to the Library of Congress to look at them, but now they're pretty much all online. Uh, there's a few select ones that aren't quite online yet. But if you go to loc.gov and just search for Sanborn map, it'll take you to that part of the, of the Library of Congress website, and you can further search there for town names and you'll find them. This particular one is the Sanborn map from 1920. And here we see that the grain elevator was actually called the L.L. Marsh Griston Grain Elevator. And we know what its capacity is and, and the various uh, elements that are inside it. We can see some all kinds of little codes and numbers and uh, gray outlines and sketches marked on this yellow box that, that is the grain elevator. Uh, just for reference there, you see the star in the upper right hand corner. That's where the photographer was standing in that 19, 1941 picture, just to give you a sense of where we were here. Well, all those little codes and stuff on the various buildings actually mean something. They're not just scribbles. Uh, and what you want to do is you're going to start studying Sanborn maps, especially color ones. You want to get the key and the map key, and you want to read through it. And this is an example of one. Uh, again, if you just Google Sanborn map key, you'll find these all over the place. It's not too hard to find the keys. But what kind of information can you see on there? Well, the first thing is all those little X's and circles in the corners aren't just, uh, they're not smokestacks and they're not doorways or anything else. They actually indicate what the structure of the roof is. Uh, remember, these are fire insurance maps. The type of roof that the building had and the type of walls it had were probably the two key elements for determining fire insurance uh, liability. The third thing that they really wanted to know about, and you'll see an awful lot of indications, is the firefighting equipment that may or may not have been in a building. Sprinklers and, and hoses and things like that. Uh, but you can see a solid circle like you see on the right there is indicates a composition roof. The larger number you see in the corner indicates the number of stories for that section of the building. Uh, if you see a indication of height, like 65 in the the gray box there, right under corn cracker, uh, that indicates that the, the height from the ground, from grade to the eave is 65 feet. You'll see another section there where it says three to six, that's 80 feet to the, to the uh, eaves. And so you can go through this and, and it tells you a great deal about what the building looked like without actually having a photograph of it. But it would still be really, really nice to have a photo of it. 
And sometimes you get incredibly lucky. I mentioned that town history I was looking at uh, for Ennisburg Falls. And when I flipped through that, I actually found this picture. And this is the grain elevator in Ennisburg Falls or the grain company. Uh, you can see here that it is indeed a, a, a feed mill. And we could see the sign there. And just out of plain dumb luck, this picture was taken about six months before that Shorty photograph. So I know that they're pretty much, this is what that building looked like in that picture. And you can see to the far left there, you can see that one story extension that I think is still part of that auto parts dealer I showed you on the Google Street View. Another building we're gonna look at here, and this is the one I'm gonna walk step-by-step step through how to build, is the, uh, the Jones store. The Jones store is the building on the right-hand side there. This picture was taken sometime in the 1850s, or, eight, or I'm sorry, 1860s or 1870s. Uh, this is downtown Innisburg Falls, Vermont, as it looked at that time. That is the original CV station to the left. The CV freight house, which is still there, is in the center. And then the Jones store is to the right. And if you look on the Sanborn maps, the first thing you'll notice is this is the store. But you'll notice it's actually an L-shaped building. That original photograph, if you can see there, was just did not have an L-shape on the right-hand side. It didn't have an extension at this point. So sometime between the 1870s and 1920, when this map was made, the building got an L-shaped extension on one side. Now, when I set out to look at this and I saw that there was a paint and implement dealer, I could have simply just freelanced it. I could have taken a commercial kit. I could have put some, uh, some signage on it that showed it was a, an international harvester or John Deere dealer and parked some tractors in front of it. That's very much what Paul Dulcus did on his old uh, Boston and Maine layout. Some of you may have seen this, uh, and it's a perfectly legitimate way to do that. It's very, very believable and very convincing. But I thought, well, if I know what it looked like one time, maybe I can figure out what it looks like now, or maybe the building is still there. So I started doing some more digging, and in the town history of Venisburg Falls, I found this picture in the upper right, which shows the Jones store is there on the left. You can just see that it has that L-shaped extension on the roof, going off to the roof of that, of that photo in the distance. Uh, back in uh, the early 1990s, the Central Vermont Historical Society magazine published an article on the Richford branch, which is the stretch of the CV that my layout is based on. And one of the photographs in there was this picture in the lower left. And it was the, feet, it was the implement dealer in Ennisburg Falls. And as you can see, the tracks are torn up there, but you can see where they used to pass through the street right there. And you can see the building has changed considerably since the 1870s. Uh, and then just going back to Google Street View, I wandered around on Google and I found that the building is still there, although it's uh, considerably uh, worse for wear. One thing I try to do with these prototype model buildings that I build is I, I try to get the dimensions as close as I can. Sometimes I do have to compress them uh, simply for space, or maybe I want to include two buildings in a scene instead of one, just to have it look more like the, uh, more like the overall prototype scene. So you'll find that when you start trying to build full-size models of prototype buildings, they're really, really big. And uh, you kind of have to compress them some places. But if you're going to compress them, I think it's important to take note of what the signature elements are, because you don't want to lose those signature elements. You still want the building to be recognizable. And you can see here, when I, when I looked at this building, I thought, well, what are the signature elements I should pay attention to? And one was this false front wall extension on the left. There was that, I think the biggest signature element probably on this building is that angled front door on the corner. Uh, there's standing steam roofing, the more and more buildings I study, and especially along my prototype, the more I notice that I'd say this metal standing seam roofing is probably 80% of them have that. Uh, so I had to figure out a way to do that well and quickly and, and convincingly. Uh, and there's a couple other things, but like I said, getting these key signature elements is usually more important than getting the details perfectly. But I did want to sort of set out and measure the details and get an idea how build, big the building is. Now, all these slides that you're gonna see about measuring this are, are all available on my blog. Um, I'm gonna put a permanent link on the tab at the top of the blog so you can get right to them if you wanna see them. And I'm not gonna to try to read through all these and, and explain it all in detail. Essentially, if you have a photo uh, and it's a fairly flat on photo, you can very often dimension it from that. Um, you can start with something like I'm showing here that 
that gable wall on the end is scales out on the on the San Bernard map to 26 feet. That's a good starting point. Uh, if you don't have any dimensions at all and all you have is a photo um, and you don't have the convenience of having somebody who stood next to the photo with uh, stood next to the building with a ruler while you took the picture uh, one thing you can use is the height of doors uh, the height of doors and the width have been remarkably standard over the years and so a typical commercial door is going to be 84 inches tall and about three feet wide it's more likely going to be three feet wide than 84 inches tall. It can off, very often be taller than 84 inches. Uh, but in a residential door is very often 80 inches tall and 32 inches wide. So that those two dimensions will give you a pretty good starting point. So once you have your actual dimension of the prototype or something you can you can estimate, you measure the dimension on the on the image, and one of the most important tools for building structures is actually shown here, and that's a caliper. And I use it for everything from measuring the dimensions on photos to measuring the material when I go to cut the parts out. Um, in this case, I'm measuring that dimension on the gable wall that I assume is 26 feet wide, and I can see it's 2.97, 2.957 inches uh, width on this particular image. You can actually measure these buildings out if you have a computer monitor and you don't want to print it, the picture out. You can do it on your monitor. But remember, if you, re if you resize the photo, you're going to have to remeasure that known dimension. Uh, so if you adjust the size of the picture, you're going to have to do that or you're going to end up getting your math all screwed up. Uh, once you know that, that actual dimension, again, it's 2.957, uh, that you take that and divide the photo dimension by your known dimension, it's gonna give you a scale factor. So in this case, 2957 divided by 321 inches, which for reference is 26 feet times 12 inches, gives you 0 0.009. So that's the scale factor for this particular picture of this building. And then the you calculate that actual dimension using the scale factor. And again, I resize the building or the picture here this is a different image. And so I had to use 0.013 as a scale factor. Uh, and you see that the width of the window is 36.038. I think we can call that pretty safely uh, 36 inches and be done with it. Again, all those are on the on my blog. And if you need a link to the blog, I provide it at the end. Uh, here's just another estimate using an estimated door height of 84 inches. Uh, we could have gone with the person, too. That's another way to estimate heights, although very often that's going to be, uh, if you figure somebody's six feet tall, you're going to get close enough. Uh, unfortunately, what I found out later in reading some description when I did this particular image, I found out this particular guy was remarkably tall for his time. He was actually over six foot six. So that really screwed up my, uh, my measuring when I, was, when I set out to figure it based on his height. So you can do all this research and you can come up with all this information, but at some point, you know, informed freelancing, like I call it, is, is going to be necessary. And these are just more of those signature elements. And in this case, I looked at a lot of pictures that I could find of agricultural implement dealers ranging from the 1880s to the 1940s. Uh, what I found a lot of them had in common was this large false front facade, like my prototype does. Uh, that's actually way more common than I would have thought it was. Uh, large signage over the doors on that and a large garage door on that false front wall. And the street side was often a lighter color than the, than the rear and side walls, which is not uncommon in older buildings. They very often would, would paint the back and rear walls or the side walls uh, you know, something like barn red and then save the, uh, the front walls, they would paint a brighter color. Here's another example. And here's a little bit later era example, closer to my own era, and you notice that this is almost bordering on tacky with the orange doors and, and white walls, but very much uh, based on the case colors. And in looking at this, and I knew I wanted to have a farmall dealer, I have no idea if the dealer I'm modeling was ever a farmall dealer or not. Uh, I decided that farmall is known as red, and I wanted to make my doors and trim red, and I kind of based that assumption on this picture, uh, where they obviously went with case orange, if I was going to model a John Deere dealer, I think I'd go crazy with green and yellow, et cetera. Uh, so the first thing I do when I put it on the layout, go to put this building on the layout, is I draw a footprint of the building, and you can see that in the lower right here. 
And this actually, the footprint there is the full scale footprint. That's full true HO scale. Uh, this works to show what'll fit in the area, but it gives no sense of what the scene is gonna look like in three dimensions. And in some cases I looked at this and I said, well, I wanna add another building as you're looking at it from the street. I wanted to add another building to the left. And so what I had to do is there wasn't enough room to do that if the building was full size. So where can I reduce the size and dimension of it? And what I found is I could take about five scale feet off the left side of the building and not really lose a lot of the character. And more importantly, it didn't really affect the slope of the roofs. And I figured all that out when I started doing the mock-up. So I had been, done a mock-up and went back to this footprint and adjusted it. And here's the mock-up. This is the, the mock-up was originally full size and you can see where that hash mark is there on the left where I cut it back in size just to make sure it still looked legitimate, at least to my eyes. The next step, once I get all this planned out, and you notice I don't actually ever draw full size, you know, fancy architectural plans of these buildings. I have the mock-up, I know what it's gonna look like, and now I basically start recreating that mock-up on the styrene, and I, I use styrene 90% of the time for my structures. And what I'll do here is I, I don't usually mark all the little circles in black. I did it so you can see it in the picture. Uh, I'll take a, a needle and I'll lay the calipers down and poke holes with the needle in the various places to get the dimensions correct and get my line. And then I'll just line up my square on there. And then I'll start cutting out the, the walls that way. Again, I don't often draw all the walls out. I just wanted you to see what they look like. Uh, I think everybody knows this. This, is, this shouldn't be news to anybody who's ever built a model, but the easiest way to cut styrene, unlike wood or uh, you know, basswood, is to just scribe lightly along your mark line and then scribe a little heavier. And after two or three lines, you can, or two or three uh, passes with the knife, you can very often just bend the styrene back and it'll snap cleanly along that line. So the trickiest part about building any structure, at least in my experience, is cutting the holes for the stupid windows and doors. Uh, there's really two approaches for this. Uh, you can use the scribe and snap method and then open up the window holes with something like a nibbler tool, or you can cut them out with a knife. A uh, nibbler tool works really well. Uh, or you can make a subshell from plain styrene, and then you can scribe and snap the walls to create the openings and laminate your final surface, like your clabbered or your novelty siding, to the outside of that subshell, and then go back in and cut the door and window openings from the back. I actually used both of these approaches on this particular model, so I'll walk you through those now. Uh, just remember that you don't get caught by this too. As you're going through this, you might have gone through all this effort to measure your doors and windows, and you know that the windows were 32 and 5 eighths inches wide. Uh, if you don't have a 32 and 5 eighths inches wide window casting, you're gonna have some trouble. Uh, I should add also, there's a third way to cut out windows and doors, which I've been using in the last couple of buildings I started working on it is one of these new Cricut cutter tools. Uh, I don't have any anything about that in this way. We're, we're doing old school in this particular model. Uh, one way, like I said, is to use a nibbler tool. You mark out your dimensions of your castings, your casting openings, and you want to measure sort of the back of the casting and leave room for the, the window trim on the outside. Uh, I dr usually drill, you, know, you see here, four holes and then one hole in the middle, and where I just go in and just drill a big hole in the center. And then what you want to do is, you want to get it big enough to clear the head of this nibbler tool. I apologize for that slide, which is crooked. Uh, but you can see here, this is used to cut uh, PC board and it has a square cutting head on it. And if you just line it up with the edge of the line and clamp down on it, it'll cut a nice square hole for you. The, the worst part of this thing, or the trickiest part of this, is you gotta get the hole big enough to get the head of the damn thing through it. So if you're dealing with really small windows, that's gonna be the challenge. And you can see here how you can start squaring up that opening from the original hole, and ultimately end up with a nice square opening. Uh, this is that subshell with the laminated surface. And if you look closely at this, this picture, you'll notice a lot of vertical and horizontal lines, especially running up and down the walls where the windows and door openings are. Those are actually where I scribed the styrene and snapped it apart and then glued it all back together to create a base wall for the, uh, for the front wall of the building. And I did this because there's really two styles of, of siding on the front of this building. 
there's clabbered or narrow clabbered on the right hand side and there's a novelty or wider wider uh, trim building on the left side or wider trim siding and this is how you kind of create that you you lay out your piece and then to get your window and door openings and you do want to mark x's on this thing uh, john narrick covered how to do this in railroad model craftsman probably 35 40 years ago and this is commonly used for brick buildings in this case i'm using the same approach for collaborative buildings you can see you got all the pieces lined back up again and you can see why you definitely want to put x's on the pieces that need to be removed because you will get confused and you can see here in the upper left hand side and the lower lower left how i have the two different styles or sorry the le lower left picture i have the two different styles of siding there and well, i have one hard. very large door yeah yeah you might want to go back one and mention those lines to line up and make sure you got the right pieces in the right order yes right here yeah yeah so that's the that's the right pieces in the right order <laughs> at least i hope it is and then what you do is you just you just use uh, plastic cement to kind of weld the pieces, the styrene back together, and let it dry. And then you want to sand the front of it just to get the the glue ooze out of it. And in theory, what you'll end up with is uh, the right sized openings for your window and door castings. Marty, do you have any recommendations for different kinds of glue? Uh, I use the glue you see here. whatever that is, testers, plastic, cement, especially for this. And I actually, this is the one time I use the big brush that comes in the bottle. I normally wouldn't use the brush at all, but I, that big, huge brush in the bottle seems to work pretty well. And what you want to do, especially if you have a bigger piece of clabbered, you kind of want to lay it down a little bit on the edge, get it to set, and then reach under it with the, with the brush and brush some more in there. I think if you try to brush it all, this whole surface at once, you're going to end up with some places that the glue is going to set before you put the clabbering on. I hope that answered the question. Uh, so what you see here is the, the building now that you'll notice that garage door opening is going to change as we move along here. As I went along, I decided to make two doors and another front door. So I did modify that lower left wall as we go along. So forgive me, I wasn't gonna rebuild the building for the sake of the clinic. Uh, then once you get these window openings and doors, no matter how you do this, you gotta do some final fitting on the windows. Uh, and in this case, it's simply a matter of putting it in place and then, then removing it and filing it, you know, do some fine filing or tweaking to make sure they sit flush and flat. And you can see there on the right, it's not sitting flush and on the left it is. And life is good. Sometimes you'll find windows and doors, very often you'll find windows and doors that are pretty close to what you need, but there's just something wrong with them. And, and like this door on the right, this, this is a Northeastern um, scale models uh, freight door. And I needed a door for the sidewall of the building. I knew it had a door there because I could see the outline of the window frame or the door frame. And I really didn't know what the door originally looked like, but I thought this one looked pretty close. Uh, so, but what it doesn't have is those casement windows on the top. So I had to get rid of those. So what you do is you just go into your window casting and you chop them off. And then you just put a, essentially a strip of styrene back on top of it. And you're reframing the top of it to look correct, to match the, uh, match the sides. And then you're ready to put that in there. Uh, very often, especially with things like big freight doors, and this is on a different building, uh, large freight doors and things like that i find it's very often easier just to scratch build them than to try to use a commercial casting there's a noticeable lack of variety in commercial castings of large freight doors like this uh in this particular in this particular case this is just a piece of o scale passenger car siding which makes obviously a wider board in ho scale and i glued a couple of pieces from uh, a, a plastruct uh, channel on top that I had kind of painted a rusted color and then I added some titchy boxcar door rollers on top of that and added a little handle on the bottom and the lower left there out of a piece of styrene and that created my uh, my freight door and I actually think I made four of these for this particular building that's shown here 
sometimes you really can't find anything to start with and you got to get a little fancier for the garage doors here there's actually two styles of garage doors in this building i built them two different ways the first ones the two smaller ones i built as kind of a unit and i took a rectangle of styrene and laid uh, one by three and one by four styrene strips over it had my window openings there and as i laid them in there, I actually cut out the window openings after the styrene strip was laid in, and then put the cross pieces across there, and you'll see the finished door here shortly. The other one, I actually built it on top of a piece of clear plastic. So it's clear styrene base with the window strips and the door strips added on top, and then I just painted the uh, door panels on the bottom of the clear styrene that's been painted. Uh, talk a little bit more about painting and weathering. Uh, if you want to get yourself uh, in a lot of trouble at one of these fine scale modeler conventions, the guys that do a lot of the fine scale and South River kits and stuff like that, go in there and ask whether you should have nail holes or not have nail holes. And you will get a wide variety of very, very deeply held opinions. Uh, it's, it's the closest in model railroading to talking politics, I think. Uh, anyway, so a couple of ways you can do this. You can certainly add nail holes to styrene. There's no reason you can't. I've done it pretty regularly on some buildings. Uh, it's tedious. I'm not sure it's entirely worth the effort, uh, but one of the things I use for it is this little gizmo you see on the left-hand side, which is called a Munster Nailer, which is something that Munster Model Works used to sell years ago. And I got one of those, and one end of it is a needle applicator for glue, and the other end of it is two little pins that are joined together, the width to, to fit as two holes or two nail heads in a uh, piece of HO scale clabber. And so you can go up and down the building and run these along and, and you can do it that way. Of course, the other way to do nail holes is a pons wheel. Uh, I don't do enough nail holes to really bother with a pons wheel. One thing I do do to a lot of styrene buildings though, just because I seem, it seems to give them a little more texture and character. The very first thing I do to any styrene structure before I put the the clabber on is I hit it with a wire brush. I run it along the length of the direction of the clabberds with a wire brush. Sometimes I'll use a sanding stick. Sometimes I'll use uh, a heavier wire brush. Uh, sometimes I'll use a stiff uh, one of that um, oh that scratching brush that Micromark and PBL sell. The old fiberglass eraser that has a little wire like a wire fine wire brushes and a brass wire brush. Uh, that's just to kind of break up the surface texture of the styrene. It lets it grab paint a little bit more and give it almost a look of some grain. Uh, the other way to do this is, or you can do is, you can actually lift the end of clabberds. This will get real tedious real fast, and I suggest you don't overdo this. But especially sort of the lower end of maybe an older building, you want to do this. And it looks like the clabbered has failed from the frame a little bit. And you can see here the technique is pretty straightforward. You cut a vertical line uh, with a sharp knife or a scalpel down the width of the clabbered or the height of the clabbered. And then you just reach under there with the edge of an X-Acto knife. Uh, you can use a number 11 blade also, or a number 17 chisel blade, I'm sorry. And, and you just kind of lift up the end of the clabbered and it'll pop up like you see in the lower right there. Again, here's two ways that I add wood texture. I use the wire brush. The other thing I use is this is a uh, uh, saw that a lot of guys that do resin or kit bashing do use in this little uh, CMKK or CMK kits. Uh, very fine tooth. It's basically a razor blade with really fine teeth on it. And if you use a razor saw like an X-Acto saw on HO scale, it creates this massive grain. I mean, it looks really out of scale and a little ridiculous in HO scale very often. But this, because it has such fine teeth on it, I use this one for uh, for adding some grain texture, especially to like long pieces of, you know, say six by six or or four by four or something like that. And it works pretty well for adding wood grain. And again, you can see the wire brush here I use for the clapboards. Uh, the next step, you want to get everything painted to look consistent. And the very first thing you're going to do with the plastic is paint everything to look like wood. And I know that's kind of a counterintuitive thing. Uh, but I paint everything to look wood first, so I paint everything tan, essentially. This is Pactra Earth, is the color I'm using here. Then I go in with a dark wash, and I use, uh, I pretty regularly was using this Hunter Line or, you know, uh, India ink and alcohol rubbing washes, and then a few years ago, I started using these Vallejo washes, which I find are 
a little easier for me to use. I like the results. I get better. Uh, they come in dark gray, light gray, medium gray. There's got a brown. They got all kinds of green grunge colors and everything else. And I probably have a half dozen of these now that I use on there. And for, for a long time, what I did is I painted the window and door casting, say, white. And then I went in and did a wash on top of it with the, with the India ink or the Vallejo wash. And what I ended up with was really dingy looking white walls and windows and doors. And so what I started doing lately is going in and actually instead of painting the wall solid white and then trying to weather it, I painted it, I weathered it, and then I dry brushed on top of that with the white. And you can see it kind of leaves some areas where the paint looks like it's faded and chipped and looks, uh, and looks worn out. And that's just a, light, a very light dry brushing with white. Sometimes I'll go back and add a second coat if it doesn't quite cover enough. But I, I personally like the effect, and I think it looks pretty good. Uh, once you get all the walls together, the next step is to assemble the building. I'm not going to belabor that point. The, tr the key here is to keep everything square. There's a couple of ways you can do that. You can use squares like I'm showing here. Uh, you can use, uh, I build a lot of resin freight car kits, and everybody that builds resin freight car kits have Kaufman clamps. And that's what these are. These are right angle clamps. Uh, these are pretty handy. They're not necessary if you're not going to do a lot of uh, a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, they're not they're not terribly expensive, but they are. I think they're like twenty or thirty bucks each. Very often you can put the building together square without these. I just happen to have them, and I, I show them. So everybody likes to show off their tools. Um, one of the other keys you have to think about before you put the building together is the approach you're going to use to the corner posts. Personally, I hate ending up with being able to see the edge of the corner post on a building. I prefer, I think it looks out of scale. In other words, if you overlaid a one by four on one side and a one by six on the other, you're going to end up being able to see the edge of it. Anybody who's ever built a laser cut kit is familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, I really prefer to just leave enough of a gap to drop in a corner post although I really know that it's it's supposed to be two different boards, but the line on the prototype would be so fine you wouldn't really see it. So I typically leave enough space in there to put a 6x6 six six or a 4x4 four four or a 60,000 square in there. And that's just a matter of when you line the, line the corners up. You can see in the lower right-hand corner of this picture, you can see where there's a gap there to put the corner post in, and that's what I do when I put the buildings together. Uh, the next step is to do braces and roof supports. Uh, a lot of my buildings I've been lighting lately, and so I want to be able to have something that looks like an interior without a detailed interior, and that's what you see here. There's just sort of this first, you know, this frame with a door and a, some wainscoting, and this is supposed to be the office of the freight house. Uh, in this particular case, this again is not the store model. And when you put the light in and the, the uh, that piece of square that my hand is on there is actually the serving as a brace for the entire building and also serving as a place to run the wires for the light so you can drop a little overhead LED in there. On the left hand side you can see that I, if it's not going to be something visible I use the beefiest pieces that I possible as styrene to make some braces and that gives me a nice flange to glue, to glue the roof to, the subroof. Uh, figuring out the roof on this particular, we're back to the store now, the implement dealer. The figuring out the roof on this thing was kind of a challenge. I, I started by getting the gable roof kind of straight on the left-hand side of the building there. And then where the extension roof was, I, I cut a square of cardboard that was more than long enough to accommodate the angle to reach the peak. And then I just cut the angle in it. And this is literally through trial and error. And I came up with a template where it fit properly. And then I took that template and used it to cut the evergreen uh, standing seam roofing material that you see there in the lower right hand corner. When I got done with that, I glued on the, the standing seam roofing pieces. And the trickiest part of using this stuff, if you've ever used it, as you know, is getting the little, I don't know, they're one by twos, I think, that slide into these notches down the, the width of the roof. And the easiest way I found to do that is to actually put a roof cap on first. So this is a uh, one by four roof cap that I'll add to both sides. And then I slide the one by two up to the top of it and then glue it from the top down and sort of fit it in the, oops, I'm sorry, and then sort of fit it into the, uh, into the notch there. 
And then once it all dries, I run, run a very fine brush of glue down the side of that notch with the one by two. And then once it dries completely, I trim it at the bottom with just a, a flush cutting clippers. Uh, painting the, steam, the standing seam roofing has also been something that's been an interesting challenge. I started by painting the entire roof with uh, Vallejo stainless steel. And then I added some streaks of thin, just burnt umber. And this is artist acrylic. And once that had dried, I went back and kind of highlighted the edges of it with uh, material from AK Interactive called Medium and Dark Rust. And this is kind of, I don't know, it dries like crusty. It's got a solid pigment to it all or solid component to it, too. So when it dries, it leaves kind of a crusty texture. Uh, again, in HO scale, this, this stuff is really meant, all these AK products are really meant for military modelers. And they tend to work in scales larger than HO. So when you're working in, H, in HO scale, you really got to watch it because some of this stuff can get away from you um, and, and look too, too out of scale. But it seems this stuff seems to work, the uh, medium and dark rust uh, pigment. And once that, done, once that was done, I blended everything together with some dark and gray pan pastels that I just brushed on lightly. I didn't like coat the building with it or the roof with it. Uh, the next step is to add the trim, and I just do that by laying the pieces in place, measuring them, marking, and cutting them. Uh, a lot of New England buildings have this built-up sort of Greek Revival sort of modified trim. Uh, and for those, you just put narrow strips of styrene in as you go along. You can kind of see the indications on those there. And again, I went with a, a red trim color uh, for the doors and uh, the shop windows just because of the, the whole farm all thing. And this is what the finished building looks like. Uh, I found an old McCormick Deering sign, farm machine sign, and I actually named the building after my good friend, Randy LaFrambrois. I have no idea what it was called in the 1950s or 40s. I don't really care. I put a sign on the front. You can see the sign on above the garage doors. Um, and it was pretty easy matter to change the name from the prototype sign to uh, LaFrambrois Implement Company and add the proper town name. This was originally a company out the prototype was out in Iowa somewhere for the sign that I found. And I just found that by Googling uh, McCormick signs. When I got the building done, I, I had left the foundation just basically painted styrene. And I, I didn't like how that looked. So I decided to play around with it a little bit. And the first thing I did is, again, going back to that 8K products, they make a thing called concrete and they also make an asphalt. And this is great if you're building a 132nd scale military diorama. It's fantastic stuff. It creates, I mean, it looks like concrete road or an asphalt road in a bigger scale. In HO scale, it looks like the kind of road that you tear your tires apart. I mean, it's just too heavy. Uh, but in looking at it, I looked around and my wife is into real fine art stuff. And she recommended this stuff on the left-hand side you see called ceramic stucco. And what that is, is that's a material that people use to paint, uh, I guess if they make a pot or something or a bowl and they wanna paint some surface on it that's going to be slightly rough, but not, not really, really rough. It's almost like a finer, it's a finer sand texture. And I took that and just kind of dabbed it along the side of my building and mixed it with a little bit of gray acrylic paint. And this ultra close up you see on the right hand side here is what the foundation wall looks like. And I, I think it looks a lot like an older poured concrete foundation. I think it looks pretty good. But anyway, that was the stuff I used with that ceramic stucco. And I'm glad I tried that the concrete first on a sample piece. I'm glad I did it on a sample piece because it really was it was way too uh, way too uh, coarse. Uh, I made a little sign for the front of the building. Again, I found another McCormick sign and just clipped it out and made a pole and a couple of uh, wires. It's actually two signs. And I put the wires, the vertical wires there, and I just glued it back to back and they're holding the wires in place. And then I uh, soldered that to a cross piece uh, on a little pole and that's in front of my uh, implement dealer now. I wanted to do an interior in my implement dealer, but I certainly didn't want to go through the trouble of building all the pieces and parts. Uh, and I guess people do everything in, in hobbies. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised as model railroaders. I Googled vintage, uh, I think I Googled vintage farm all dealers. And this picture on the lower right hand side came up, this color photograph. Uh, actually, both of these came up. The one on the upper right is, a, is obviously a prototype shot. 
the one in the lower lower right hand side is a guy's garage out in Iowa who was apparently into collecting McCormick nearing parts in a big way. And this is what his, you know, quote unquote layout room looks like. Uh, so I simply took that picture and I sized it to the width of my building and I glued it to the inside back wall of my garage section. And I parked a Walther's tractor in there, a red Walther's tractor, and that's my interior. Uh, anyway, that's really all I've got for now. Uh, again, if you want to, uh, see some of this stuff, especially the, the slides on how to dimension buildings from photos, et cetera, which I probably didn't explain terribly well. You can check out my blog. I think a lot of folks know about this. I see comments from a lot of the people I recognize on here, uh, but it's just central Vermont railway, all stuffed together dot blogspot.com. I do have a YouTube channel that I post to far less regularly than perhaps I should. And if you want to find my username on YouTube, it's just CVSNE. So if anybody has any questions, I'll uh, I'll turn the floor back over to you guys. Hey, Marty, when you were talking about books of various towns, I should mention the Images of America series. They're about $20, $25. Um, uh, there must be hundreds of those done usually by local historical societies or local authors. And they have lots and lots of great pictures. I probably have a dozen of those. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of great sources. I mean, it's just, uh, the, uh, what are they called? Uh, Acadia, I guess, Acadia Publishing. Is that what it is? Yeah, there's yeah. a whole, like, going to any bookstore now, there's hundreds of them. Yeah, so Images of America, I think, is the series name. The publisher has changed once or twice. So better to search for Images of America than Acadia. Yeah. Oh, I see what I have to do. I have to go to Google. So how do I unshare this thing here? Let's see. Should be a straight up uh, stop sharing. Might be under I view see. options. Oh, there it is. It's in the, it's on top on this one. There we go.